Hello. Uh, <laughs> hello. Hey. I hope we're live. Oh god, there's always a part where I'm like, are we live? Aren't we live? I don't know. Um, hope we're live. Wait, I'll full screen this. Please. Hi. <laughs> It's Monday, June 11th, and we're trying to figure out whether or not we're live. Uh, Twitch says we're, we're online, so that's interesting. Um, and today we said we're going to be hacking on threads. Yeah, that's, that's right. So, um, <laughs> oh wow, everyone's online. Good morning, everyone. Also, hey, <laughs> I wasn't paying attention to chat for a second, but everyone's here. That's very nice. So, hello. Uh, yeah. So, uh, thread hacking. The reason for that is, oh God, our, my my cat just woke up. I th I think it was like, oh, you're so quiet. I'm not coming over. Kitty cat will say hi in a second. But um, I want to build this API. Uh, that that's 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 my main thing. Like. I want to have this API where I can have on one side append data into a thing and on the other side read data out of a thing. And you can't do both because like in, in synchronous code, this would like block forever and then you could never execute this. Like you can't call this after this while this executes, right? So you, you, you can't do asynchronous listeners. And I, I want to figure out a way to do that because it means on the one end we can like put data into a thing. And on the other end, we can read data from a thing, which means we have like a, a two-way connection of sorts. And I, 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 I just want to figure out how that one works. May, may, maybe there's no good way. Maybe there's a really good way. Um, I'm kind of just mostly curious how we would do this. So that's what today's stream is about. <laughs> uh, hope everyone just thinks that's entertaining enough. Um, cat, no, no cat. Um, er earlier, like my, um, my, my one key wouldn't work. It's because there was like a little kitty snack stuck in my keyboard, which is very much how things are right now. Um, Kochi QQ asks, is this memory safe? And the answer is yes. That's what Rust is about, allowing you to do these uh, very concurrent things safely. Unless you choose to not do them safely, at which point, uh, yeah, you got a problem. But um, they're generally quite good, so don't worry about it. <laughs> so fu fu fun story I heard about concurrency. Like, I'm, I'm from JavaScript. Well, memory leak equals memory safe, huh? Oh, you wouldn't leak memory. Like, don't worry. Um, but a fun story I heard uh, about a Mozilla office somewhere is that they used to have a poster on the wall which said you need to be this high to uh, write concurrent code or uh, parallel code. Uh, and, you know, no one's that high, so that's that's the joke. I thought it was funny. Um, but yeah, Rust is intended to uh, fix that. Oh, by the way, let's say we're live. Uh, we're live, live. Uh, Twitch.tv slash. Uh oh, Kochi, Ko Kochi QQ says I write JavaScript too. Cool. What kind of stuff do you work on? When? Yeah, it's eleven minutes. It's not five. Um. Oh, cool. The cat just curled up next to the thing. I I think she's she's pretty chilled out now, which is great. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Oh, nothing now. All right, that's fair. We can't always help projects, but React and True, of course. Oh, cool, True. That's nice. All right, so let's start off by creating a new project. So I've got this command called ew. We just can like call a random thing on it. So we're gonna call this uh, Playground Rust. Uh, reds i guess or we could hijack the other one but i just want to do uh playing around the round with rest of threads and under my name uh, playground rust threads there we go so what do we have here we have uh rust threads uh rest stop book doc 
There we go. So we open up the docs because we're going to take a look at the excellent REST programming language book, 2018 edition, because sure, why not? We go here and then we say threads and then we look at it and then we say, okay, cool. And the, the, the way you do a thread is uh, like, this. actually, I'm not, I'm not sure if we should be doing threads. Uh, so my, 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 my main idea, <laughs> my, my main idea here is that on the one end, we can append data into a feed. And on the other end, we can read data out of a feed. And that, that's about it. Um, oh yeah, actually, it's not quite about reading data. So on, on one end, we append data into the feed. And on the other end, uh, we made a series of events. So we always want to have like this in parallel, which is very important because um, uh, like on the synchronize event, we might want to um, say, say we're going to build a UI around this thing, right? then whenever there's a peer added or a peer removed then we like need to update the ui and there needs to be like a way to get this working so i just want to get a feel for it i think mostly that's the part and i i i in turn do think that we can um uh how do you say that oh uh just more or less make this do whatever Hmm. Yeah, we, we don't need to care too much about it. All right, all right, so here it goes. Let's, let's, let's try this example over here. So we got lib, uh, which we don't need. Oh, actually, let's, let's take one step back and update the thing that I never updated because we need to. So um, templates, right. So the, 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 the eel command uses my directory called templates, uh, which I can then call and inside of it. There's like a bunch of shell functions which I can just update. So the eel command is always like up to date. All I need to do is update the, uh, update the templates themselves, which allows me to create like new projects with whatever I, I think is the, the right way to create them. So I, I update my templates every couple of weeks or something because I figure out something new. So um, we should probably update it because I just realized we're not doing a thing that we should be doing. Right, so um, the relevant one here is Rust uh, main, Rust lib rs, Rust lib rs, and we need to remove these two because uh, they're broken, and then we need the Rust toml, okay. The other one, Rust toml, and then we remove Clippy from the thing, and then we're good. Oh, dot. Travis, Rust, Rust Travis, and then we need to fix this one with dash 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 check, and then we're good. All right, that, that's all we need to do for for you here. All right, uh, okay, 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 also okay. Updates. Uh, update rust templates and then then we we have an update here yep 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 yeah how was everyone's weekend did you have a uh, have some fun also hey wise and grim welcome oh and pop hey nice to see you uh, oh my my camera is a bit laggy oh i'm i'm sorry um, it, it look, it looks well here. So I think it's just the stream delay, um, go, go, going over the wire. Um, but I can reboot it webcam because may, maybe like the way it's picked up is a bit not great. So maybe that fixes it. I, I, I hope so. Welcome everyone to the stream on Monday. Um, all right. So templates updated. Which means we can like go into the thing we just created and let's let's try out some stuff actually we should probably turn this into a main one oh it's better nice great um so move uh source lib source main yeah it's actually a command uh main main and then we're just going to print line sub 
cargo run. Cool, and it uh, outputs the little sup command, which is what we wanted. Oh, actually, I'm kind of curious now. Obj dump. So I've been doing a bunch of obj dump. Um, He he he, uh, obj dump dash dash help. Oh, which I don't know what it does, but I believe the one was dash t. Dynamic sys, no, dash, yeah, dash regular t. All right, so let's, let's try this out. Obj dump dash t slash tart or target slash debug slash uh, playground rust threads. There we go. Cool. Then we'll just pipe this into less. And there, there we have it. The, this is our program, the internals. I learned this the other day. And we can look at uh, the internals and that's kind of fun. And that's all I wanted to show. <laughs> <laughs> There's also a cargo build release, which does some more optimizations. And then we can like replace this one with that. And then we should have a slightly smaller binary with a few fewer commands. Is this interesting? I don't know. I, I think it's kind of interesting. Anyway, um, yeah, that's that's not what we should be doing. So this, this little thing here works. So let, let's take a look at this thing where you say, cool, we should use a standard thread in time. So here we say, use standard thread time right and then we say thread spawn uh, on the one end and thread sleep time duration yada 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 right so we'll just copy paste that uh, we paste it there and then we say uh, uh, time and then time, and then we do that. So we say cargo font like that. And then we say uh, cargo build, cargo run. All right, so that works, right? So on the, on the one end, we have a separate thread. Uh, and we say spawn one from main, one from spawn, three, three, one, 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 yada, 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 which, which is kind of fun. Uh, which very very clean. Waiting for all threads to finish using join handles. Oh my god, is where it becomes like complicated. Maybe we should like install a new release of Hypercore and yeah, we don't have like the uh, streaming interface yet. Hmm. So I'm not sure how to do this. The, the thing is, um, we will have, so in, in this example, we will have one feed, right? And then we append data into it and we like call commands on it from somewhere, but then we also have like the feed on the other side and it's like weird. Oh my God. So today's episode is a bit of, um, how do threads work? <laughs> Because I, I, I get the idea abstractly, but <clears throat> I have like no good intuition about it yet. Uh, async await. Let's take a look at uh, a to run async await. Oh, where's that preview thing? So there, there's a preview going around for the async await code. Uh, which includes two macros, which allow you to write this stuff, but they don't allow you to do borrowing quite yet, which sucks. Um, I just want to know how it works because I have no idea. I get the idea that, you know, in, in theory, uh, we could all put it on the same thread or multiple threads. It doesn't matter. And then on the one end, we have an async block where we call, uh, like we, we could wrap this. So vaporware ABI, right? If anyone knows anything about this, by the way, step in at any time. Um, so here, uh, if, if we were to have like some form of async iterator, 
I think the way this would happen is like that, or async event in feed, or uh, await event in feed. And then here are all the blocks. And then because this is an async block, um, uh, we could just append that because that's considered asynchronous. So it's just whenever, right? And at this point, we would kick off this code, which probably triggers on, on the next take of the loop. And then here we have append. We can do that. And ideally, this would be uh, a way to append or something, right? Because that should be an uh, asynchronous operation also. And then the, this just dumps it into a separate thread, which allows us to do a thing. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm not entirely sure how this works in the current situation, right? because in, in Node, you would write this uh, as not even process next, sec, just uh, feed dot listen, whatever, like that or something, right? And then uh, console.log uh, events e.name or whatever, right? And then here is feed.append again. And, and the, this by the way it's done is now asynchronous, so it's in line and that's great. Um, now, how do we do that in Rust? That's the next question. Um, and I, I suspect that's the answer is um, threads. Like, I, I don't mind spawning a dedicated thread for this, um, but maybe we should skip that step and move on to Tokyo directly, just skipping over the, the low-level thread stuff. Because if, if we look at what we have here, like, th this just works. We just say thread spawn and then uh, do some synchronous stuff here, and th this works separately, and that, that's all great. And, you know, we can have multiple threads, and we can, like, combine them. Um, maybe we should try to use mutex or something because that's probably where we'll end up. Sync and send threads. Hmm. Oh yeah, mutex and arc. Uh, mutex. Oh, so we skip over that. So rest mute. Like there, there needs to be a way in which we can share the feed. Uh, ideally in a non-blocking uh, way where on the one end um, it pops out all the events and on the other end we can just like continue reading and writing to it as normal. Um, maybe maybe it means it needs to uh, return a specific object which is then uh, in a particular way or we need to wrap the whole thing in a mutex which is gonna suck a lot <laughs> yeah uh i'm i'm guessing the thing here is what if we just drop in a mutex Let, let's create a new hash map and try and edit it from two separate threads using a mutex that might be the easiest or depend to a vector instead of hypercore and Dump it into a mutex? I don't know. Oh, Roger Kamal asks, a little off topic, but what do your tattoos mean? Uh, um, the answer is not much. I just like the way this one looked and I have like a bunch more here. Like that's a palm tree. Um, that's, uh, well, uh, that's a half full glass. Uh, got like one here, which is a Bowie knife. Got like another here, got like another here. I just like it, and um, that's it. There's not really hidden deep meaning there, <laughs> which yeah, that that's that's the way I do things. All right, uh, let's read this docs. Um, standard sync mutex, a mutual exclusion primitive useful for predicting shared data. Yay! So ba basically, the idea of mutexes are. Uh, if you have two threads uh, and you want to share some data, then 
if you access that point in memory and you read it at some point and then like you operate on it, it um, how do I say this? Say, say we have a bit of shared memory, just like uh, eight, eight bits and we store a value in it, the value one. If two separate threads read that same value and are then like, well, you know, oh, we read one, we're gonna increment it by one, then the end result will not be three because it's one on, like one plus one on one side plus one on the other side. Um, it should be three because you're up, updating it by two, like one plus one plus one in total. Um, because they both read one as the initial value, the incremented value will be two for both. So instead of three, it becomes two, and that means you more or less have like a race condition in, in a sense. Uh, so you want it to be atomic. You, you want it to be like, well, you know, hey, hold on, I'm, I'm reading this value. You can't read this value because I'm busy. And it like it updates it by one, and the second one is like, okay, cool, now you're done. Now I can read it and I can update it, and then the end result becomes three. So it, it's like a lock on the thing. It says, well, oh, hold on, I'm currently busy with it. Okay, cool, now it's your turn. Um, and there's different types of uh, mutexes being done, uh, aka locks. So, you know, here here they call it locks and whatever. Um, there, There's the spin lock, which there he says, well, you know, uh, just keep on spinning your CPU. There's the uh, weight-free locks. There's the all sorts of different types of locks. I believe the, the, the weight-free locks is one of the better ones. Um, yeah. So the, the idea here, um, the, the, the tricky part with mutexes is, is what if two people take out like a lock at the same time, right? Um, or what if they're both waiting on each other? That's called a deadlock. That's like, oh God, you know, we're both waiting on this thing to complete. And no one's actually holding a thing or uh, your code crashes in the middle and it never releases the lock. So there, there, there's some tricky bits there. Rust is cool because it's uh, mutex lock, uh, because of the, um, uh, what do you call it, the drop trait. Whenever a thing is ended, it will always release the lock. So whenever the mutex goes out of scope, the lock is released. Uh, in C++, this is known as uh, resource allocation is in is initialization, uh, which is the same idea. It's a fancy name that doesn't mean much, but it's, it's the same idea as Rust which allows you to have like auto drop basically. Um, and I, I guess uh, this is um, the same thing. So they're like, this mutex will block threads waiting for a lock to become available. The mutex will also be stacked with initialized query via a new constructor. Each mutex has a type parameter which represents the data that's protected. The data can only be accessed through the uh, RI guards returned from lock and try lock, which guarantees that the data is only ever accessed when the mutex is locked. All right. So poisoning, I believe that means taking down the thing. I don't, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I only know, yeah. <laughs> um, so the mutex is in this module implement strategy called poisoning, where mutex is considered poisoned whenever a thread panics while holding the mutex. Once a mutex is poisoned, all other threads are unable to access the data by default as it is likely tainted. Some invariant might not be upheld. For mutex, this means that the log and trial log methods return a result which indicates that whether mutex has been poisoned or not. Most mutex, uh, most usage of a mutex will simply unwrap these results, propagating panics among threads to ensure that possibly valid invariant is not witnessed. A poisoned mutex, however, does not prevent all access to the underlying data. The poison error type has an into inner method, which will return the guard that would have otherwise been returned on a successful lock. This allows access to the data despite the lock being poisoned. Cool, so it's kind of interesting. Uh, this means that, you know, whenever an error, critical error occurs, the mutex is like, yo, I'm in an invalid state now. Uh, we should probably do something about it. But then it, it allows you uh, a mode where you can save it. Uh, so it's flexible enough that you can like change it around if need be. Um, so it returns an error and you can handle the error and you can access the data from the lock. Whereas you know, like, well, it's not in a great state right now. And then probably through like a loopback mechanism, reinitialize the mutex and try again somehow. Um, but that doesn't sound great. Uh, like this should never happen. Seems pretty terrible. Seems like a panic might indeed make the most sense because it, it means the, uh, the mutex thing is now <laughs> is, is having problems and, and you don't want to hit that case. So, um, But still, 
you know, no code's perfect, so I, I guess it makes a lot of sense. Um, I heard that there's a library called Parking Lot, which doesn't make use of uh, this exact Mutex implementation, which may be worth looking into. Uh, but I kind of want to get a sense for these Mutexes first. Can we have an array that we access from two different places and modify? Can we have uh, an iterator in one side and like another thing in the other side? Will that work? Right, and then and then move on to uh, different uses here. <sighs> so, um, what do we do here? So they get uh, snap sync arc mutex thread, and uh, um, what's that again? I forgot. Rust. I I, I hope every, everyone that's like reading along or listening along uh, kind of gets the direction we're trying to go. Uh, if not, like ask away, I'd be happy to like uh, answer whatever questions people have. Also, I'm still learning, but I have done a little bit of research about it. So, you know, always happy to help. All right. So in this case, um, spawn a few threads to increment a shared variable non-atomically and let the main thread know all increments are done. Uh, probably should zoom out a little bit because the text seems... There we go. That's a bit better. That's actually what it was intended. Hey, Tonka Cool. Welcome. So we create a. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Right, so we iterate from zero to n. We create a thread per thing. Oh, here we go. Uh, arc new mutex is zero. So we just put a value inside the mutex, uh, which in this case is just a counter. Then we spawn 10 threads. Then. Uh, we get the data from inside the lock. Yeah, so we, we, in each thread, we lock the data. If data and transaction stand to unwrap. Interesting. Transaction received to unwrap. Interesting. Cool. Uh, Tonko Kuo says, I've just seen that you moved a bit to Rust recently. Yeah, I have. I'm really enjoying Rust right now, and it's it's a lot of fun. So, pretty happy with uh, exploring some new things. All right. So, we have data lock unwrap. I'm not exactly sure what this does, but I'm guessing it is to block the main thread. Because if the main thread goes, then all the threads will exit also. So here it's just waiting for one thing. And then this makes sure that, uh, while holding the block. Yeah, yeah, so here here it's literally just waiting for the uh, thing to go out of scope. The thing I'm really curious about is how to handle errors in, um, in a threaded situation. Maybe we should Google for that. Rust thread handle errors. Error handling in Rust, error handling the programming language, Rust recovering from a panic in another thread. Yeah, that's not exactly what I'm talking about. The thing I'm mostly thinking about is what do you do when there's an error happening in a separate thread and how do you make that propagate up? My guess is it should send the error between thread boundaries and handle it the way you do. Um, in JavaScript, there's generally two approaches to doing this. Um, either you abort all the things that are in flight. You just say, well, we're going to discard all these things, uh, cancel them if possible. Say you're like having 10 HTTP requests, you can cancel the connection um, and just be like, yo, no longer interested. Or you continue to execute all of them and then uh, continue with the, the results possible. I generally think that canceling is the best approach, uh, but yeah, there, there's a few nuances there on air handling in Rust. Armin, Ronakas, Woods. Uh, I feel like I've seen that name, in there, name around, so I'm kind of curious now. Error handling in Rust. 
Yeah, list person, mm. Rust, load document, thread, thread. Is there a thread in here? Mm, yeah, no. I believe this person made, what's it again? Flask, is this the Flask person? Flask, oh yeah, that's the person, interesting. So I've been doing Rust since 2014. That's kind of interesting. I've only recently seen them around because I've only recently seriously started doing Rust, but it's pretty cool that they've been around for four years now. Um, all right. So here's what I wonder. Um, okay, so this will simply work. Um, All right, let's copy this code. Fuck, we should just copy that. Expected Adam. Oh my god. So function main. Yeah, there we go. That's a bit clear. Cargo run. Right. And then we do uh, print line data, I guess. Oh. Uh, there we go. And this should probably show the data locked kind of thing. Uh, data dot lock. Now let's see what this one returns. Lock mutex data locked. Oh, bah, bah, bah. Uh, let's do a thing here. Print line data. So this should execute ten times, where it says, "Well, it's the data locked." So I'm I'm guessing uh, because we need to dereference it. It's uh, equals data locked, and then we get the reference data. And that should give us the inner value of the locked mutex. At least that, that's what I'm thinking right there. So the receiver dot receive unwrap should block for a while and then uh, the data that lock bit uh, is called after all the other locks have occurred because the receiver hasn't received anything is what I suspect is, is how this works um, oh we should add some colon there Uh, cannot be dereferenced. Oh my god. Uh, oh yeah, there we go. Cargo run. There we go. Um, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and we never incremented there, so it's always ten. Now, what I wonder, uh, oh, yeah, I, I guess we can't access the data without locking it. Okay, so I'm kind of curious what happens there because we're not dereferencing it, so it just gives us the lock, the mutex lock, mutex card. Rajik Kamal asks, why do you use Linux instead of Mac? Um, so I've used Mac for about four years. I used to use Windows before that. Actually, I used Linux briefly, but you know. Um, but yeah, I, I was up for um, getting a new laptop and I don't like the new MacBooks. The keyboards are terrible. I had to like carry a, a, around an external keyboard with my old Mac, uh, like all the time. And the touch bar and stuff, I was just hearing people have like terrible, terrible problems and I don't have great hands, so I'm quite, uh, quite susceptible to RSI. And I was like, hey, you know what? Uh, I'm paying a premium price for a pretty, subpar computer that requires 
dongles and external keyboards and it has a touch bar that I never use and software updates that haven't added much value in recent years. And they're adding more and more restrictions on what I can do with the file system. Meanwhile, I'm deploying all these things on Linux. Maybe I should just get uh, a ThinkPad because it, I've heard good things about it and I like the build quality and I like not having to travel with dongles and they claim to have really good um, power uh, battery. So I, I tried it, I went to the store, I saw it, I liked it, and then I switched. And I have no reason to switch back because it's, it's been the best computer I've ever used, um, hands down. So I'm, I'm, I just think Linux computers are a lot better uh, when you're doing pure programming stuff uh, for programming. If you don't, uh, if you don't mind too much time uh, configuring it, um, so in, in my case, I used Arch Linux because I was like, well, I kind of want to learn more about Linux, so might as well spend a couple of weeks uh, configuring this, which is what I did over the Christmas break. Um, yeah, <laughs> would I recommend Arch Linux and using Linux for everyone? No. Um, if you're doing lots of graphical stuff, then yeah. There, there's no good graphics programs on Linux. Haven't found any. Uh, haven't attempted to use Wine either, but that just sounds like a stack of hacks. Uh, but otherwise, you know, if if you're doing like server work, building APIs, other stuff, um, it's it's quite nice. I hope that answers your question, uh, Raji. <laughs> bit bit long form, but yeah. So uh, cool, cool. You're on Arch also. I I don't really care too much about which Linux distribution I use. I like Arch's package manager a lot, but setting it up was a bit of a pain. And I'm, I tried setting up a personal server the other day. It's still a bit of a pain. So you know, it it's not for everyone. I think, but once you get it working, it's it's quite nice. Wes and Grimm says, there's any good uh, graphics programming on Mac either. <laughs> so I, I'm i not sure if you meant programming or programs, uh, because I, 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 I see like a difference there. If, if I mean, if you're like, it's, it's whether or not you use OpenGL or um, uh, what do you call it? Like Sketch. I don't mind Sketch. I, I, I think it's reasonable. I think Photoshop is pretty reasonable also. Um, and yeah, there, there, there's nothing even coming close to that. I was trying to like draw a circle. I had like a thing and I just wanted to cover like a piece of a bitmap or what was it, a JPEG or something. And like the game doesn't allow you to create a circle. You need to create like a circle selection, do a fill. It's super weird. I just wanted to draw like a few squares and a few arrows between a bunch of squares and put some text on it. You know, like sketch is pretty good for that kind of stuff. No. Nah. No, nothing like the best I could do was like a browser based cloud thing and I'm, I'm a little bit allergic to those I I just want like a snappy local thing that just works and yeah <laughs> which, which is not to say that they're, they're not great I get it but yeah actually I, I I'm not sure if I've seen it I might have seen it do I have this starred oh I have it starred yeah 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 I have I think I ended up using this for like some stuff because it's it's literally the best way to do certain things. But as you could see, the loading time wasn't great. <laughs> Has compiled version for Linux? What? Gravit Linux. Hold on. Because if that thing works, I'll I'll just send it money. Like. I, I want someone to have a great tool for Linux. How to install, how did you do that? That's amazing. Please, please share your secrets. <laughs> a cross-platform design tool for the 21st century. What? Use it, download. Okay, download, snap package. Oh my God, no, it has snap. Ugh. I hate snaps. <laughs> uh, but maybe the thing has it. Grab it. Grab it, please, 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 please say yes. Please, please say someone made it. I would be very happy. 
Gravit, uh, Gravity, Gravit Designer Bin. There we have it. Out of date. <laughs> Empowering everyone to design. Okay, Gravit Designer Bin. That's all right. Uh, our Gravit Designer Bin. Let's let's take a look at this. Oh, Weisengrim says, oh, I always think of games programming when I hear of uh, graphics programming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's fair. I, I, I didn't mean to say graphics programming. I meant like editing tools. Yeah, yeah, that, that's the distinction there. I think like Windows might take the crown with the way Unity is done. Um, oh my God. This looks like it might actually work. Huh. Check it out. 2018 for 29, and that's great. Which is two months ago. And now it's a snap package. God, I don't like snap packages. So he, here's a weird thing about snap. Um, it runs a daemon in the background that uses for like installing stuff and like running stuff. And I have no idea why a daemon is required for that. Like in Linux, everything's basically a file. So all you need is a bunch of files and that should work. Or better even, you, you just create a binary. You execute the binary and the binary just runs and, and ta-da, voila. That, that's all you need. But for some reason, I don't know. <laughs> I don't get it. So yeah, I'm a bit sad, but maybe there's hope. Maybe there isn't. Maybe we should just ping them and be like, yo, could could you like not? Hmm. Pia, 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 pia. All right. Thanks for a tip though. I'll be saving that. Uh, I should probably close that. Um. Pyom 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 All right. Um Okay, so let's take a look at this parking lot thing. Because I'm kind of curious now. All right. So we have an array here. Uh, vec, like that. Or just, yeah, it's an empty vector. And then we say data.push or data.push1. So print line there, print line there. If data equals n. I don't like this. <laughs> Data clone transaction dot clone. All right. Mutex, and this is actually data. All right. God, like the, these semantics are complicated as hell. I don't like it. Args that receive receives the data at the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 
Um, so handle, thread, set, send, handle, join, stuff, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So th th this is basically the fan out pattern where you're like, cool, here's a bunch of threads, please do a work. And then at the end of it, um, they uh, combine the results, which makes a lot of sense, uh, especially with the handle stuff here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you join all handles and then that works. Um, so I'm, I'm not entirely sure how to approach this part because con conceptually what we're actually trying to do is create a JavaScript API where we have one async bit that operates in the background and we have a few other like, you know, the, the rest continues as intended, um, which is different. Like I, I get it, but th this these are like very basic example. It's, it's a great example though. Like don't, don't get me wrong, I'm thankful that you sent it. Um, I'm slightly looking looking for the more uh, the trickier async stuff. In in a way, it's not too dif different from uh, mini HTTP. I'm I'm guessing this is pretty much the way it is, right? Tokyo mini HTTP is kind of similar. So may maybe I should like dig into Tokyo because uh, build status examples, hello world, right? So what happens here is, uh, yeah, TCP server new dot serve, okay, hello world, right? Where hello world is, oh my God, this is kind of interesting. All right, cool, so th this is uh, a struct, yeah. One call future, okay, all right. But yeah, the, the you, you can write code on line 43 that will be executed. And they, this is like in a, uh, done in the background. Stat, well, actually, let's look at the Tekken Power because there, there's a few things that required there. All right, okay, Tekken Power, and it says slash JSON, two string, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, all this stuff is just not useful. Yeah, so you create a new one, you specify threads, and then you say serve. Yeah, I don't like that. Um, let's take a look at the final one. Like this also works. Um, so Matt Magix asks why Vim and a normal ID. I like the word normal, it's a bit loaded. Um, very much depends where you're coming from, I guess, what you think is normal. Um, I like Vim because it just works on lots of places. It's very configurable and um, works well with like Tmux. If, if you end up like doing everything in the terminal, uh, it just works real nicely with it. And I, I like the end result where it just barely takes up um, any CPU. When I'm like coding, it can just be like, oh, okay, cool, let's jump to this different project. And then that's it. <laughs> Mark Hadley asks, have you lost a kitten yet? I think she just went back for a nap. She was hanging out for a bit. And then she went for a nap, hold on. Actually, she fell asleep like right here, hold on. <laughs> yep, she fell asleep. Right here, I thought she walked out the room, but you're entirely right. She just disappeared out of my field of vision. I think she's taking a little little kitty nap um, right about where my feet are, but inside this little furniture thing. So I've got like one of those IKEA rollies where she's just like napping on like some, on my camera or something, I don't know. <laughs> so Wes and Grimm asks, what's the project switcher? Uh, it's Tmux. You, you might've heard of it, but yeah, it's pretty nice. So, you know, um, dot files and like other stuff. Uh, that I can like jump between things like that. So it's really nice. I've got like some custom commands allowing me to initialize sessions and stuff. Um, and in, in the end, like 
if you end up doing like all this stuff in terminal, you can just, you know, use lots of commands there and then like jump between projects and it all like works real nicely. And I, I kind of prefer to like having an IDE, which includes a terminal uh, emulator inside of it. I, I prefer the other way around. Uh, oh yeah, that, that's come in like newer versions of uh, Pmux, like half a year ago. A year ago is when they added it. So uh, if you don't have it, update Tmux and you'll you'll get it. Uh, okay. Yeah, actually, so the the API we kind of want is very similar to uh, to this, but the the branching path is a bit what worries me because I I don't know how to do this. Um, so let's let's take a look at the internals for a second. Uh, also, p kill polybar, poly polybar top. Cool. I was a bit annoyed that that wasn't working well because I can't inspect my CPU level there. <laughs> All right. So let's take a look at source. Uh, what's the dependencies first? So I'm guessing they have. Futures, they have Net2, Tokyo Core, Tokyo Proto. Oh, yeah, all these things are deprecated now. Net2, HTT parse. Oh, that's kind of fun. So, source, what I have, lib. It's kind of clean. I like it. Uh, implement async read, async write plus static server proto for uh, HTTP. And I say, okay, cool. Interesting. Implement decoder for HTTP codec. Implement encoder there. Mod date request response. Pub request response. Pub struct HTTP. What's the API again? Uh, examples. I'm just trying to make sense of how this works. So you initialize, you implement service for the thing. And then you say TCP server colon colon new. All right. And then you hand, oh, you pass it HTTP, which is Tokyo Mini HTTP. It's HTTP parser. And you pass it adder, which is also okay. And then you say dot serve and you pass it status service, which in turn, uh, allows you to do a bunch of routing inside of it. All right, all right, all right, I see it. That's okay. That's kind of interesting. So it, it, it's a TCP parser and forwarder for this thing. So I guess Tokyo Mini HTTP colon HTTP is the interesting part. And for the other bits, we need to look into the TCP serve, um, how they're doing things. Whoop, lag, webcam. Blah. I'm a little bit annoyed by this because it's not great. Um, we could just go into build this event thing just so we have something. But I don't really want to do that quite yet. I, I, I want to dig a little bit deeper into this. So create knowledge um, slash stuff uh, okay computer slash blob slash computers slash other things oh my god i'm gonna sleep here um rust crits things oh uh packages that's confusing all right um so what do we look for in here we say tokyo oh so it's tokyo h2 all right oh yeah so i guess this is uh the lock api from parking lot async away yeah Um, without boats, async awaits, uh, async await notation, 
async, 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 blah. He's written a lot about it. Um, without blogs, there we go. All right, and the main the main goal here. What is that? Why, why does it have that? That's weird. Um, the main goal here is to look at uh, async methods to object safety, object safety iterator, uh, because we're looking for the futures away. This is the one we wanted. All right. So the, this is the syntax that will allow you to use async await stuff <sighs> with the futures crate. Um, but I, I want to know how to do async blocks, which is, uh, oh my God, this is actually really nice. Okay, cool. You can also have async for loops. Stacking asks, why not use Actix web? It's pretty much recommended by the Rust team and most likely get ported into Rust 2018. Um, the short answer is we're not doing HTTP things, so it's not relevant to what we're trying to do right now. Um, the longer answer is I, I quite like Actix web. Uh, if I were to be doing HTTP stuff, I don't mind it that much. Um, I do think it's missing a few chances where I, I have some very specific feedback on Actix web, by the way. Um, first off, it's not using hyper for better or worse. But I kind of, I kind of like hyper uh, hyper take on things where it's trying to establish like a nice little foundation. On the other hand, Actix is, is working out really nicely also. So having a bit of competition there is probably great. Um, uh, but yeah, it has a bunch of stringly typed APIs, which I was uh, not too fond of because I, I tried it out and it was like, for, for example, it, it, when you're defining a route, it will not, at, at compile time, it doesn't tell you like, yo, your argument order is off. It just tells you nothing. So you're you're building a service and, and there's just a bunch of stuff missing. And that that's like not great. Like for, I have this one server called, uh, what is it, Access? And there's definitely a bug in there. And the, the compiler's not telling me what's wrong. Uh, where is, I wish it would. So I don't know. But um, I, I was looking at the HTTP crate to look at the uh, implementation specifically uh, because I was trying to figure out how they're like using uh, like the, the uh, generator stuff. What do you call it? Yeah. <laughs> so that, that that's why I was looking at the internals of it uh, a bit more than the other stuff. But yeah, so I, I, I hope that makes sense. And thank you for your suggestion. Um, all right, so it's kind of cool. So we can do async for loops. Uh, now the important thing is, will this be blocking on the thread or will it not? All right, so an async for loop will propagate errors out of the function, so message has the item type of the stream passed in. Know that async for loops can only be used inside of an async function. Um, so I'm not sure what that means. And finally, you can create a stream and uh, set up a future. Uh, via async stream item equals something stream yield s all right all right all right all right so i'm curious what the error handling story of this looks like item equals error equals right so for message in stream uh, uh implement foo Actually, let's try out this module. Oh yeah, we're gonna try out this module. It may or may not work, but let's hope it does. Um, cargo add futures await. Cargo add futures. And that's cargo built this. And probably the stream's gonna lag in the meantime, so there we have it. All right. I'm gonna go for a quick 30 second walk or something while this installs, just to stretch my legs, because this is gonna take like a moment. So <laughs> enjoy, enjoy the 
comp compilation screen, I guess. Oh, if it actually worked. Hold on. I hope the little spinner starts working and then... Okay, now, now it works. All right, all right, all right. Go back. Awesome. <laughs> Comment around this as riveting footage. Yeah, thank you. I uh, I think it's very enticing also. <laughs> yeah. But that's that's life, right? You uh you win some, you compile some. <laughs> Stacking asks. Uh, well, now the question changes to why not use Actix for futures, which I'm assuming you're doing. Uh, great question. Uh, Actix in general, maybe. Like, I haven't thought about doing that, but I think it might be overkill. Uh, that's more or less my take on it. Like, I, I think I need to go lower than this. Because what, what this ends up doing is like create a bunch of actors, right? And uh, yeah, more or less what we're trying to do. Wait, hold on, I can show you. Uh, so hypercore, oh, raid me. So what we're trying to do here is make this API happen where we can just do a bunch of stuff here. So that, that actually what we want to do here is make this async so this can like proceed and we can also like append data into it and like do some other stuff. Like ideally in, in fantasy syntax, we could do this and like plop this thing inside of it, right? Like there or something. Oh, I guess my copy paste just broke again. But yeah, I, I hope you get the idea so we can like continue under it. So I don't know. Also, uh, welcome Justin Learning. And thank you. What a compliment. Um, 
Like, you know, Actix is great for certain things, but not for a thing I'm trying to do right now. I don't think. So I'm just trying to go like, because they're, they're, they're a bit lower level than whatever Actix has to offer, right? It's like a whole framework and like it spawns a bunch of things. Uh, I believe so. I can actually double check, so no. Oh, it mentions Tokyo, so probably. Oh yeah, yeah. Then that's literally they're they're just using futures, so they're they're abstracting over the thing that we're trying to use, so it can just as well like just use it directly. Is is my take on it? Um, all right. So now we have these. Okay, let's wipe this code. We don't need it. Um, so I'm kind of interested in the way this would work. Which operate over the stream tray. Um, function, fun, learn, fun stuff, fetch, clients, e fetch all provide URLs one at a time. That's interesting. So apparently, with the uh, async underscore stream uh, annotation, we can define our own uh, streams. Uh, I'm I'm just reading a second your comment right there. You'll have to like give me a bit more details than that, because I I can't really um do anything with that. Because I I I know exactly what it is that they want to be doing, and what they want to be using in Rust is literally syntaxify this exact module right here. So you see the async function fetch here, right? They want to make it so you can prepend the async keyword in front of it, and that'll just be the exact same thing. Um, same for like async stream where you could, you know, they haven't decided on how to do that one quite yet, but something along those lines, definitely for the async loops. Like what if we prepended this async keyword right there for a wait message in stream along those lines? Um, so I'm, I'm not sure what you mean it's higher level, which is the way Rust wants to go with futures. Um, like if, if you're concretely interested in what they're trying to do, read this post by Boats, um, who is uh, the person that's mostly leading uh, the async await effort. Um, like here he's talking about, what if we made async traits, right? What would be the requirements? It's the second in the series, which is pretty much how do we convert this one into something that's fully interoperable with everything in the language. So I'm, I'm, I'm just a bit lost about that comment. Maybe you could provide a bit more uh, context there because I'm, I'm not sure what you mean right now. Um, so my, my understanding is also like Actix is more like, what if you have a collection of things that need to interact or a bunch of function more or less you're building an HTTP server or another type of service which has la layered uh, error handling and I I don't know I'm, I'm not comfortable with the thing which is um, yeah just not because <laughs> I've, I've never done actor based programming um, but then I you know looking at Act Actix web they went back to uh, just a transform function like oh here's your initial function here's like your middleware you can nest it, cool, here's routers, here's you know more middleware, cool. And at the end of it, you just have a function which takes a request and returns a response of sorts, right? So it's, it's transform function. That, that's the, 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 the way to reason about the thing. Um, so I, again, I'm, I'm not entirely sure how this would fit. Um, ho hopefully I'm not coming off as too, as too stern. I'm, I'm just genuinely curious what, what you mean by that because I'm, I'm also new to this. Um, dum -bum -bum -bum. <laughs> um, right, so what I'm trying to do is get one of those block. The await macro allows blocking on the future to completion. This dot does not actually block the thread though, it just blocks the future, yada, 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 yada. 
thread? No. Okay, cool. That'd be interesting. Um, bum, 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 bum. I'm so interested in how to create an async block. Oh, here we have it. Awesome. Yes, perfect. Okay, this is the money. All right, so what we wanna have here is an async block, which where we can do some stuff, and that's amazing. Uh, I'm not gonna skip this, no, I'm gonna postpone it. I'll take a break in a second. Yeah, here we go. I say that server, TCP connection bind. Um, this macro is similar to async and accurate future. It can be used in an expression context that doesn't need a dedicated function. This macro can be considered as run this block code asynchronously where the block of code provided like an async function returns a result of some form. All right, all right. Core.run future. If you like some pre-computation in the future, let absolute path content await read file. Uh, okay. I, I think this is very interesting to um, allow for certain things. Okay, so we enable two features, which is apparently required. Uh, all right, so this allows us to do some stuff. It's mostly the, the async trait thing there. It's kind of cool. Borrowing, borrowing doesn't really work so well today. All right, so there's a problem. All right, that doesn't work. That may or may not work. Features and traits. Trait for my stuff. Trait, 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 trait. Ok, 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 ok. All right. So the, the, this is starting to touch on some of the problems that I'm experiencing, which is namely how do we do some of these things here? Stream yield, accept connections. For object in fagile objects, let description equals await. Fetch description, stream yield description. All right, all right, that's pretty interesting. So I wanna know what the await macro exactly does, which allows waiting on the future to complete. The await macro can only be used inside of an async function or an async block and can be thought of as a function that looks like this. Uh, Okay, so we do need to propagate errors inside of that macro. That makes a lot of sense. Oh. I have something stuck in my pants and it's poking me in the butt. I think I got like a little beer can or soda can lid, like a little metal pointy thing and it's like stuck in my pants somewhere. So I was like, oh, I can totally like leave it in there but I can't get it out. So it's kind of annoying. Uh, Right, so the thing here is await future result f item f error magic. All right, so you do end up handling errors with a question mark there. That's great. Cool, that's the way I was thinking it would be. And then this is internal so result and it returns io result evacuate. Okay, cool. Async for loops over stream in server incoming. This is very interesting to me. I, I think this is the crate we should be using for this because it, it allows us to conceptually reason about things uh, better. But the async block um, looks differently than what I was hoping for where it's not a thing that executes in the background, um, but it's, it's more of a thing that allows you to not define a function. So 
so I, I don't know how to go about that. Mm. Let's look for parallel. Whoa, what's going on? Everything's lagging and I don't know why. Oh my god, it's the little screen over here. Webcam. There we go again. Something went wrong and I don't know what. I'm sorry. I guess it like got stuck in a loop. <laughs> Something like that. Uh, how long have we been going for? Hour and 15 minutes. All right. <sighs> All right, so async block. So the main thing about this is async block let's take a look at this so here it says uh create future for async block which will eventually be resolved and then we run that future uh, and again this thing allows us to return a future from a function oh my god Yeah, this is tricky. Does anyone have like suggestions here? Because I'm 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 getting like a bit stuck in the loop in my head. Um, well, on the one hand, we have uh, I can I can draw out exactly what we're trying to do in JavaScript, which I actually already did. Um, damn it, I'm not sure. You know what? Gonna make myself some coffee. I'll be back in eight minutes or so, nine minutes, and we'll try and tackle this. I'll think about this for a second. Be right back.
Minute 20 seconds. Oh my god, what's that? Hey. All right. So my coffee's being uh, poured. I just poured a bunch of coffee. I think I figured out um, the right way to reason about this. Breakthrough. So, um, uh, all right. Let, 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 let me explain what I had in mind. All right, so uh, let's create a new little notepad slash foob text. Actually, let me, let me check in on the cat for a second. Yeah. All right. Uh, Kitty is alive and and very well. She just gave a little meow. I don't know if the if the microphone heard it. Uh, she's very happy. All right. So uh, the idea here is say we have uh, function one, right? It has a scope. And what what we're trying to do right now is on the one end is have uh, I mean, this is just pseudocode. Doesn't matter is on the one hand, we have uh, our uh, our stream slash async generator, right? So this creates value. It says like, oh, here was an event. Oh, look, here's another event. Oh my God, look, there's another event. Right? It does stuff with that. Now that's on one side of the thing. Now on the other side of the thing, we're uh, continuing, not so much with the stream or async general, but uh, regular code flow, right? But that that's uh, inside of this. So basically what's going on is we have function A, and on the one hand, uh, it's, it's branching into B, and on the other hand, uh, it's branching into C, right? Uh, my, my branches are off along these lines. Yeah, it's, that's more or less it, All right? So it, it goes two ways. Like the, the stream is one part, 
their regular code flow is the other part. So what ends up happening is um, both of these uh, can emit errors. That's entirely optional. And A in turn uh, like uh, is able to propagate errors forward. So let's call this uh, our hypercore code. Right. So what what the, the the important realization here is that even though uh, we might have four, uh, we might have this code right here. Uh, where is it? Uh, here, right? Like th this is the initialization code, so that's a parent code, and like this is one branch, and this is the other branch. So it's it's simple. How do we do parallelization of this code? How can we um, close both blocks uh, when it exits? So the, the, the short answer for that is we, we should figure something out. <laughs> uh, the, the long answer to that is, well, you know, if, if we're going to be using a thing in parallel, um, sharing a thing, we'll still need to be using mutex of sorts. Um, so I'm I'm not entirely positive, but at least realizing that this is a, a parallelization problem uh, means we can do some directed search, amongst others, uh, Tokyo Parallel or uh, Rust Futures Parallel. Because the, the, the important thing here is uh, probably Rust, zero cost futures and Rust Futures Parallel and completes. Uh, concurrent day parallelism in Rust. So I'm not entirely sure how this works. By the way, is everyone still with me? Yep, still streaming at a great 30 frames per second, uh, which is actually not that bad. So um, yeah, Parallel, 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 mapping, sequential composition, mapping, joining, selecting. Uh, those are not the things. What we just want to do is, is uh, promise all from JavaScript, but add it to like uh, Rust. Um, Right, so this is kind of interesting because you create a, a sequence of promises, right? And in turn, this creates one promise that says, well, I'm gonna execute both at the same time and I'll resolve it when, when I resolve it. Um, Rust promise all. Maybe we should ask an RC. Because the, the cool thing about this is, you know, you just branch it out and you can handle the errors if either one like doesn't work out we just close it off. Um, it, it might continue to execute. Ah, it's such a tricky thing if you if you break it down to like the basic bits. How do you do this? Um, working group CLI, the join future? Maybe. Join future, Russ. Thanks for the suggestion. Maybe that's it. Uh, Rust future, join two futures together. That's a great one. Oh, we should probably uh, move that one there. There. Uh, future join, amazing. Oh. All right. <laughs> Um, Rust promise future promise library. No. Join future. Join future. Get out the our uh, docs dot futures. Please work. Uh, what do we install here? Uh, futures. Yeah, so that should be the one. And then we can like go in here and say join. 
and we say future join. I guess no variadic arcs quite yet. Future for a join combinator, waiting for two futures to complete this created by future join method. All right, all right, all right. So this is kind of nice. Let me say AB. Um, what do you mean by I guess no variadic arcs quite yet? Um, debug for join AB. So it returns a future, it returns an error, an item an error. So the item or something needs, so it's two items. B equals error, A is future error. Yeah, it looks kind of, oh, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so the, 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 the cool thing about this is, you know, um, hold on. <laughs> This is pretty trivial to overcome, right? Because say uh, A, like if, if this is um, a join of A and B, is how do you make this a join of A, B, and C? Well, you turn this into another join of, uh, on the one end, uh, B, and then here, C, right? So th this will be a complete parallelization of the problem, which is the way you do variadic args. If you can combine two and it results the thing that itself can be combined, you can just create a tree, which will do the whole thing. So in this case, every time uh, a thing doesn't work, we take the right hand node and we replace it with another join of the two items it would otherwise be. Is it ideal? No, but it kind of works probably. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we could actually probably trivially write a macro for this, but um, in, in this case, I need exactly two joins, so I don't mind it too much, but I, I get what you're saying. It would need to be a macro anyway, but uh, yeah, it's kind of good. Awesome. Actually, so, someone should write a macro for that. If this actually works the way we think it works, All right? Uh, okay, I'm going to grab my coffee and wash my hands because the cat just licked my finger. Be right back. Ah, oh, nice. Future join. Oh, that's kind of interesting. Wait, does that actually work? That's really, hold on. I'll be right back. Oh, snap. You're totally right because it returns the last instance of the thing and the last thing. So that totally works. That's amazing. Amazing. Hold on. I'll be right back. <laughs> By the way, kitty cat really wants some attention. She's like eyeing at me. She just followed me into the kitchen. I was like, hey, you're you're up. She's now looking at her little litter box. No, nope, no, 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 no. She prefers hanging out here. Okay, th this might not end well, but she should come and say hi on stream again. Oh, she's clawing her little toy. So th this is her little toy. She really likes it. Maybe we can focus on, on what's going on over there. Hey, kitty cat. What <laughs> time? I think it's playtime. I'm just going to sip some coffee, but I, I really like the approach. Thanks, Ray. I don't know. It's, uh, it's just kitten time for now. <laughs> but I can, I can still move the microphone closer. It's kind of fun. <laughs> it was pretty good. So here's the thing she really likes to do. She likes to gnaw on the, uh, on the string. She already broke the string about four times by like just sharpening her little teeth on it. 
And the only way to like make her let go is to actually let go of the toy and then she like properly lets go. Because that becomes boring. So yeah, everyone say hello to Chashu. She's been away. She's been like asleep for the last hour, which is how we got away with streaming. But now she's woken up and ready to um, dig her claws into, into things. <laughs> All right, I don't. I think if I like pick her up, she'll get like really annoyed and might not end well. But we can still try it. <laughs> Hold on. Okay. 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 Hello, everyone. Oof. Hey. Hey. Careful. Careful. Okay, 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 okay. No, she really didn't want to be picked up. She <laughs> she clawed me over here, which I probably deserved. <laughs> but yeah, so that's Chashu. She's really cute and she really likes to play and doesn't mind getting a little bit rough. But like, for example, clawing me or my partner. <laughs> so yeah, I think I think we'll have to like enjoy this for another like four minutes, five minutes maybe, and then she'll have had like enough and we can like continue properly streaming. Uh, so yeah, kitty cam. <laughs> Yeah, her favorite food. Um, actually, does anyone have any questions about Chashu? Happy to answer. Her favorite food is probably little tuna blocks. Kitty sets clear boundaries. Yeah, sort of. She's very playful right now. She's like uh, kind of going into hunter mode. Look at the way she's got like her tail down, looking at the toy. Like. Ugh. clawing things, doing things. <laughs> oh, she really drew blood. Oh my god. Well, I did deserve that. Yeah, last night we had to like lock her out of her uh, bedroom because she was like zooming around the house. She really likes jumping on the mirror, but to the point where the mirror might actually fall. Um, so I was like, yeah, you know what? We, uh, you're gonna have a little bit of a timeout. You're gonna sleep by yourself tonight because you're a big girl now. And she meowed once, and we let her back in, and she was like zooming around again, and we like didn't let her back in. We let her just let her back in this morning, which is good. She's learning that certain things are okay, other things are not okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, you can all watch her clean her butt. It's very good. <laughs> oh. Dan Reeves asks, is it still super warm in Berlin? Uh, no, it's it's quite all right right now. I don't know, it's like uh, 20 degrees, maybe between 15 to 20, depends on whether or not you're in the sun. It rained really badly yesterday, so it cooled down quite a bunch, if you don't mind. Slow down. So there's a plant here, uh, which is toxic to cats, which is why we keep this door locked unless I'm here. Because if she eats that cat she'll, or that plant, she'll just get really sick. Um, so even if she's like sniffing it, I just gotta like pull her away. And she doesn't like that, but it's for her own health. But yeah, it's probably good that I'm working from home while baby cat is here. So she doesn't feel too alone. Instead of like at a co-working space or something, leaving her alone by herself. Yay. 
Yeah, I think she's almost done playing. About two to three more minutes. Look, she's, she's not that into the ball anymore. 